Committee will come. Committee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any point, <clears throat> pursuant to Committee Rule Four. The chair may postpone further proceedings on approving any measure or matter or adopting an amendment. Without objection, all members may have five days to submit statements or extraneous materials on today's business. As members were notified yesterday, we intend to consider 11, now 11, bipartisan measures and amendments on block. Pursuant to notice for purposes of markup, I now call the end block pa package consisting of 11 measures. H.R. 3373, <coughs> Office of International Disability Rights Act. H.R. 5338, Global Hope Act with a McCall Amendment. H.R. 4864, the Global Child Thrive Act <coughs> with a Castro Amendment in the nature of a substitute. H.R. 4508, Malala Yousafzai Scholarship Act with a Smith Amendment. H.R.S. 752, supporting the rights of the people of Iran to free expression, condemning the Iranian re regime for its crackdown on legitimate protests, with a Deutsch Amendment in the nature of a substitute, and an Engel Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute. H.R. 2343, Peace and Tolerance in Palestinian Education Act, with the Sherman Amendment in the nature of a substitute. H.R.S. 754, expressing the sense of the House of Representatives that the United States should continue to support the people of Nicaragua in their peaceful efforts to, to promote democracy and human rights and use the tools under United States law to increase <clears throat> political and financial pressure on the government of Daniel Ortega. H.R. 630, Counterterrorism, Counter -terrorism Screening and Assistance Act of 2019, with the Zeldin Amendment in the nature of a substitute and an Omar Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute. H.R. 3843, Countering Russian and Other Overseas Kleptocracy Act, which is the Crook Act, with a Keating Amendment in the nature of a substitute. H.R. 2444, Eastern European Security <coughs> Act, with an Engel Amendment in the nature of a substitute. H.R. 4331, Tibetan Policy and Support Act of 2019 with an Engel Amendment in the nature of a substitute and an Engel Amendment in the, <coughs> to the amendment in the nature of a substitute. H.R. 3571, City and State Diplomacy Act with a Lew Amendment in the nature of a substitute and a Meeks Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute. Senate 1340, the Ebola Eradication Act was noticed for this markup, but I'm not calling it up at this time. H.R. 2529, the New START bill was noticed, but I'm also not calling it up as well since we have a few things to work out. I will continue to work on this bill and list it for the next markup. At this time, I recognize myself to speak on today's business. I'm pleased to support all of the bipartisan measures before us today, and I thank our members for their hard work. I'll keep my remarks brief and highlight just a few of the 12 bills and resolutions. Okay, I'll turn now to the Countering Russian and Other Overseas Kleptocracy <coughs> Act, authored by Mr. Keating and Mr. Fitzpatrick, on the subject of Mr. Putin. Putin and kleptocrats like him keep their power by corruption, enriching a circle of loyal cronies at the expense of the citizens they represent. And as we've seen here in our nation, they export corruption to gain leverage over world leaders and undermine democracies from within. As we take this measure up, I'm reminded that prior to becoming, taking office, President Trump spoke against the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which bans bribery and other corruption in foreign business dealing. So I'm pleased to support the Crook Act, which provides support to other countries combating corruption. I also wanted to thank Mr. McCall for his work on the Eastern European Security Act, a measure that mirrors my bill, the NATO Defense Financing Act. It's critical that NATO allies modernize their military forces and shift away from reliance on Russian or old Soviet-era equipment. This legislation, which would complement U.S. security assistance, 
allows for loans to our allies so they can update their equipment and security needs. Our own security depends upon a strong NATO alliance, so I hope all members will join me in approving this measure that supports our European allies. <clears throat> Next, I'll turn to House Resolution 752, which reaffirms our support for the rights of the Iranian people and condemns the Iranian regime for violently cracking down on protests. In the past months, I've been horrified by the images coming from Iran. Peaceful protesters met with violence, abuse, and brutality. Internet and communications technology completely cut off and censured. It's just sickening to see the way that the regime treats the people of Iran. So I'm pleased we are considering this measure to reaffirm Congress's longstanding bipartisan support for the Iranian people's right to freedom of expression and our strong opposition to the regime's cruel tactics. I hope all members will join me and support this measure. Next, I'll turn to my amendment in the nature of a substitute to the Tibetan Policy and Support Act of 2019, a measure authored by my friend Mr. McGovern, the co-chair of the Congressional Executive Committee on China and a leading advocate for the people of Tibet. Congress has always been a strong supporter of the Tibetan people's right f fight for their religious freedom and human rights. Now, Beijing has made it clear that they plan to select future Tibetan Buddhist religious leaders including the next Dalai Lama. It is an unthinkable violation of the basic principles of religious freedom that the Chinese government would choose the religious leader for the Tibetan people rather than allowing the Tibetan people to make this decision through their ancient and sacred <coughs> traditions. So with this bill, we send a clear message. If Chinese officials infringe on the religious freedom of the Tibetan people in this manner, we will hold them accountable. I am proud to support this measure and hope all members will do the same. Next, I want to thank Mr. Jeffries for his Malala Yousaf Zee Scholarship Act to ensure that at least half of USAID's merit and needs-based educational scholarships in Pakistan go to women. I'm glad to see it's named after Malala, an iconic champion for girls' education who persisted and who the Taliban attacked simply because she wanted to go to school. This is an excellent bill that I'm proud to move forward in today's markup. And finally, I'll turn to the Global Hope Act, a measure I co-sponsored with Ranking Member McCall, a longtime advocate in the fight against childhood cancer. The Global Hope Act takes the successful advances developed in the U.S. to fight childhood cancer and uses them to explore public-private partnerships for this mission throughout the world. It's a good bill I'm pleased to support. I strongly support all the measures we're considering today, and I urge all members to join me and do the same, and I'll now recognize our ranking member, Mr. McCall of Texas, for his remarks. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chairman Engel, uh, for working with me and my side of the aisle over the past year to move important bipartisan measures uh, through the committee and the House. I think today we are once again demonstrating that we can get things done in Congress. Uh, today, we are considering 12 measures, including two measures I introduced, the Global Hope Act and the Eastern European Security Act. I'd like to thank uh, the Chairman for his support and for partnering with me on the Global Hope Act. I founded the Childhood Cancer Caucus over a decade ago, and since then, we've made tremendous strides towards taking steps to cure this terrible disease. I'm proud of the bipartisan work we've accomplished. In the United States, childhood cancer is largely curable with over 80% survival rate. Sadly, in developing countries, this is reversed. The mortality rate for children diagnosed with cancer is 80%. In Africa, it's high as 90%. Uh, this is unacceptable, particularly given the low cost uh, measures and drugs that we have to cure this disease. The United States has invested billions of dollars through PEPFAR and other programs to strengthen health systems and reduce disease burdens on developing countries. Because of these sustained investments, we are seeing impressive gains in global health and infectious disease survival rates. This bill is an opportunity to build on those successes. Important activities are already underway and showing results, including training doctors and health professionals, increasing access to low-cost generic medications, and interventions such as Texas Children's Hospital uh, in Botswana. In September of 2018, the Global Health Organization announced the Global 
initiative for childhood cancer that aims to reach at least a 60% survival rate for children with cancer by 2030. And the private sector has stepped up to the plate and worked with health ministries and invested money on their own. Uh, that's why I introduced the Global Hope Act, to leverage the strength of the United States government, global health, health activities by partnering with the private sector, NGOs, hospitals, and international organizations. My bill authorizes the Secretary of State to engage in public-private partnerships and build on the successes of our current programs to address childhood cancer. This bill does not take away from our existing infectious disease programs, but rather catalyzes effective partnerships with hospitals and the private sector to work with health ministries, train medical personnel, and support the infrastructure to diagnose, treat, and care for these children. A child's survival, survival from cancer uh, should not be predicted on where they were born, and I look forward to working with my colleagues on this important bill. On the Eastern European Security Act, it's vital that NATO uh, member countries who were formerly part of the Soviet bloc have modern and effective defense articles that are easily integrated with those used by the United States and other NATO allies. The Eastern European Security Act authorizes direct loans to these NATO allies so that they are not dependent on Russian or, form, or former Soviet-era defense articles. The bill supports our NATO allies and American jobs and is the best way to secure the alliance. Lastly, on the Iran resolution, I'd like to thank my colleagues, Mr. Deutsch and Mr. Wilson, for their work on a resolution supporting the rights of the people of Iran to free expression and condemning the Iranian regime for its crackdown on legitimate protests. This resolution is an important step in responding to their protest and subsequent crackdown. Um, I think particularly with this maximum pressure campaign, Iran is starting to feel the, the squeeze. They are crippled. Uh, they are getting provocative. And now is the time, I think, to, to act uh, so that we can topple uh, the regime and free the Iranian people and the, rights, the human rights of the Iranian people. And so with that, I'd like to thank all the members of the committee. I know it's a busy day today. Uh, and uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. McCall. Mr. Sherman. Mr. Chairman, this is perhaps the most partisan day in which has been perhaps the most partisan year in an era noted for its extreme partisan divisions. Yet today we will pass 11 bills, all of which have wide, near-unanimous bipartisan support. It is a testament to the chair and the ranking member of this committee that those who listen to our proceedings in audio format, who hear but do not see, have difficulty discerning which Congress member is a member of which political party. This committee is an island of calm in a very stormy sea. I support the en blanc measure and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Sherman. Mr. Smith. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, these are great bills. I want to thank uh, Mr. McCall for his efforts to try to mitigate the challenge of uh, childhood cancer in the developing world. Uh, I also want to thank uh, uh, Congressman Jeffries for accepting my amendment. Uh, uh, as difficult as it is to be a woman in search of an education in Pakistan, it's even more difficult if you're a woman who was part of a disfavored religious minority. My amendment includes reference to religion as a factor in marginalization in response to a need identified by the U.S. Uh, Conference of Catholic Bishops on behalf of all, I say again, all religious minorities in Pakistan. I want to thank Albio Siris, especially for his resolution in Nicaragua. I first met with Daniel Ortega in 1984 on a human rights mission to Nicaragua uh, when there was a terrible war going on. Uh, and his human rights abuses, which were egregious and pervasive then, continue to be so today. So thank you, Albio, for uh, a great resolution. I also want to uh, speak to the Tibet Policy and Support Act of 2019. Uh, I am the prime Republican sponsor of that bill, working with my good friend and colleague Jim McGovern. Uh, just last month, 24-year-old Tibetan former monk named Yan Ten set himself on fire. And he is one of 150 self-immolations which have occurred over Tibet uh, in, since 2009 in protest of China's continuing and worsening occupation uh, of, of, those, of, the, of the people. Uh, what could drive a man to that extreme? Well, under Xi Jinping, 
Uh, there has been a, a, an expansion of the effort to erase Tibetan culture and to bring about what they call the synodization of Tibetan Buddhism, just as it seeks to bring all religions, religious believers to heal in China, a phenomenon which I discussed in an op-ed article that I wrote for the Washington Post nearly a year, a year ago. Xi Jinping is trying to take every faith, including Tibetan Buddhists, and say they must kowtow to him and to Marxist-Leninist uh, principles, uh, or else they will be jailed, uh, tortured, uh, and even worse, killed. In the past year, according to the China Commission, and I am the former chairman of it, and I'm currently the ranking member, the Chinese government has forced Tibetans to remove photos of the Dalai Lama from their homes. And whose picture goes up instead? Xi Jinping. This Congress this year has a list of important acts of legislation focused on China. Two Hong Kong bills, a bill just the other week on the human rights situation of the Muslim Uyghurs, and now we are addressing the issue of Tibet. Keep in mind that just one year after the communists took control over the Chinese mainland, China began the process of annexing neighboring country of Tibet. Beginning in October of 1950 uh, and continuing into the next year, troops of the People's Liberation Army marched into Tibet, uh, easily overcoming resistance and forcing the government of Tibet to acknowledge uh, the overlordship of China. An uneasy period of semi-autonomy existed until 1959, when Tibet tried to overthrow the yoke of communist occupation. This, too, was crushed and crushed brutally. China completed its incorporation of Tibet, and the Dalai Lama fled 60 years ago. In exile, the Dalai Lama became the personification of Tibetan national and religious aspirations. 30 years ago, the Nobel Committee recognized the Dalai Lama for his peaceful challenge to Chinese occupation and his defense for the dignity and autonomy of the Tibetan people. This year, incidentally, I plan to nominate the Hong Kong protesters for the Nobel Peace Prize and hope that my colleagues on this committee will sign that letter of nomination. I would point out that Liu Xiaobo, uh, I led the effort in this house, uh, and it was joined by people all across the world when he was named uh, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, and that at least brought a tremendous focus on the ongoing human rights abuses uh, by China. In the 17 years since the original Tibetan Policy Act of 2002, the human rights situation in Tibet, sadly and tragically, has worsened. The Chinese government has refused to enter into dialogue with Tibetan leaders, and Chinese officials have threatened to select future Tibetan Buddhist leaders, including the successor uh, to the 14th Dalai Lama, in clear violation of their international religious freedom obligations and the traditional practices of the Tibetan Buddhist faith community. Furthermore, the policies of the Chinese government have severely degraded Tibetan religion, culture, language, livelihoods, and the natural, uh, natural environment. This bill, along with the Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act, which the Congress passed in 2016, uh, sends the right message to Beijing. The fate of Tibet, its people and resources and religion are a strategic interest to the United States. But above all, they are entitled, they are entitled to freedom, and they are entitled to democracy. Uh, I yield back uh, the balance of my time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Ceres. <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for calling this markup. I am grateful we are able to advance these bipartisan measures today. I want to speak about the resolution I introduced with my colleague Francis Rooney, ranking member of the Western Hemisphere Subcommittee. This resolution highlights the severe human rights abuses that have taken place in Nicaragua since last year and conveys bipartisan support for the people of Nicaragua as they seek to reclaim their fundamental rights. Last year, repression by Nicaraguans security forces resulted in more than 300 deaths. Amnesty International described the Nicaraguan government's repressive tactics as, as a deliberate strategy of shooting to kill of shooting to kill. Independent experts from the Organization of American States found that Nicaraguan officials committed crimes against humanity. Unfortunately, the situation remains dire. Today, there are over 150 political prisoners in Nicaragua, while hundreds of others have been released. They're, they are routinely harassed by the authorities. Tens of thousands of Nicaraguans have fled the country to escape prosecution. A recent report from Nicaraguan civil society organizations 
detailed the torture and abuses suffered by 56 political prisoners in Nicaragua, including sexual abuse, suffocation with plastic bags, and electric shocks. This resolution makes clear that the United States Congress stands with the Nicaraguan people who are demanding accountability in the face of such brutal repression. It calls for a tangible steps, it calls for tangible steps from the Nicaraguan government, including immediate release of all political prisoners and the implementation of electoral reforms that Nicaraguan society, civil society organizations have long called for. However, the resolution also makes clear that if the Nicaraguan government continues its repression, the international community should increase economic and political pressure on the Nicaraguan government. I appreciate the efforts of Congressman Rooney and his staff to work with me on this important resolution. I thank Chairman Engel for this effort to have this markup, and I thank all our members and their staff for the hard work, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Sears. Mr. Shabbat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to discuss briefly four of the bills before us today. Um, as former chairman of the Middle East uh, Subcommittee, I want to thank Mr. Deutsch and Mr. Wilson uh, for their hard work on HRS 752, which I'm a co-sponsor. Uh, this important resolution reaffirms our support for the rights of the Iranian people and condemns the regime's crackdown on recent protests. The people of Iran have a right to hold their tyrannical rulers accountable for the economic stagnation that they have brought upon their country. Second, uh, I'm a co-sponsor of Mr. Sherman, Mr. Zeldin's H.R. 2343, the Peace and Tolerance in Palestinian Education Act, uh, which seeks to weed out uh, anti-Israeli propaganda in Palestinian textbooks. Some Palestinians are willing to live side by side with Israel in peace, but there will not be peace, truly peace, uh, until more Palestinians are willing to do so. And one step in the right direction is to stop teaching hate in the Palestinian schools, and these uh, textbooks are a big part of that hatred. Um, third, I'd like to mention uh, Mr. Series and Mr. Rooney's HRS 754, uh, which I'm also a co-sponsor. This important resolution expresses our unwavering commitment uh, to democracy and human rights in Nicaragua. Uh, the Ortega regime has brutally suppressed protesters, and over a year and a half later, uh, no one has been brought to justice for arguably crimes against humanity. Uh, Ortega's lust for power and rank corruption proves he has long overstayed his welcome. It's time that Nicaragua had a free and fair election reflecting the will of the people uh, to bring needed change to that country. And finally, I'd like to voice my support for H.R. 4331, uh, the Tibetan Policy and Support Act of 2019, and I want to thank Mr. McGovern and Mr. Smith uh, for their work on this important legislation, which defends the religious freedom of Tibet Buddhists uh, by uh, affirming the religious nature of the Dalai Lama's succession. The Chinese Communist Party is unwilling to recognize any authority beyond its own power, human or divine. Uh, we cannot live in a world where government, not people's consciences, determines how religion is to be practiced. With that, I would urge my colleagues to support uh, these bills and many of the other bills, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chabot. Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I thank you and the ranking member for bringing uh, 11 bills to this markup. Um, I regret that we're not going to consider two bills, um, especially the Luger-Tauscher Act, and I certainly look forward to uh, next year when we do address that issue because I believe that um, a failure to extend the New START agreement risks the utter collapse of any structure on arms reduction uh, between uh, Russia and the United States, and I think that creates a very dangerous world. So I, I hope we will address that. I also uh, want to echo part of the sentiments of uh, my friend from California, Mr. Sherman, in terms of uh, the bipartisan nature of the approach of this committee, which is certainly something um, I hope we will continue to pursue. But I think it's also important to say bipartisanship is not intrinsically good or bad. It is not a goal in and of itself. It is a means toward an end. And bipartisanship requires two parties to willfully agree to compromise and cooperate. 
Um, and the one denying its support cannot be used as a lever to prevent the work of the people's business. Um, and uh, I would simply note that. I, I support bipartisan approaches whenever and wherever we can achieve them. But they are not a goal in and of themselves. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to talk about the Tibetan Policy and Support Act, H.R. 4331 in particular. Uh, this past August, I traveled to Dharamsala, India, uh, with the House Democracy Partnership, where we met with His Holiness the Dalai Lama for several hours, as well as officials from the Tibetan government in exile, the Central Tibetan Administration. We heard firsthand how the Chinese government has strengthened its persecution of Tibetans through expulsions and demolitions of religious sites, the marginalization of Tibetan culture and language, and further restrictions on Tibetans' travel, uh, especially through third countries like Nepal which is an issue I hope this committee will take up because it's, it's creating a very serious situation for the exile community in Dharamsala. I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of H.R. 4331, the Tibetan Policy and Support Act, to update and strengthen the Tibetan Policy Act of 2002. In response to Chinese official threats to select future Tibetan Buddhist leaders, this bill establishes, a, as U.S. policy, that the succession or reincarnation of Tibetan Buddhist leaders, including the future 15th Dalai Lama, is an exclusively religious matter to be decided solely by the Tibetan Buddhist community, not by the Chinese government. <clears throat> I think that's a very important assertion by this committee and by this Congress, and is a strong symbol of support for the Tibetan people, and I hope um, a source of warning to the Chinese government not to interfere with such an important process. Um, I believe uh, reinforcing and supporting uh, the goals and aspirations of an entire ethnic population, the Tibetan people, is a very important value for this committee and the, ultimately the Congress to support and reassert. And I thank the authors for bringing this bill before us. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Chairman Elliot Engel, our, our lead Republican Michael McCall for bringing these important bipartisan measures before us today. And I appreciate and uh, want to reaffirm the comments by uh, Chairman uh, Jerry Connolly. Uh, indeed, we can work together on bipartisan issues that are important to the American people. I'm grateful to support a number of these bills, and I appreciate the committee's continued commitment to bipartisanship and cooperation. First and foremost, I would like to express my strong support for my friend Chairman Ted Deutsch's H.Res. 752, supporting the rights and people of Iran. I truly believe that we are witnessing history today in Iran. Protests have erupted in mid-November over an announced rise in price of fuel has managed to ignite a massive countrywide popular protest that challenge the very nature of the political system in Iran. The Iranian people want a government that works for them, not to prop up a network of criminals and terrorists that include Assad and Hezbollah. The Ayatollah cares more about death to America and death to Israel than he does about the Iranian people who have lived through unimaginable suffering over the past 40 years at the regime's hands. The great heritage of Persia has been subverted. The foremost state sponsor of terrorism in the world has reacted in exactly the way any terrorist group would to these organized expressions of democracy. It is killing protesters by the hundreds, with a recent report suggesting the number could reach 1,000 persons killed. In some cases, the terrorist regime is even, to, even refusing to return bodies to the families and loved ones. The news has been tragic, but I am hopeful and inspired by the energy and commitment of the people of Iran. I believe that one day we will see the Iranian people take back their government and their destiny. This important resolution sends a strong message of support to the Iranian people, and I thank Chairman Deutsch for his work, as well as for his tireless advocacy on behalf of human rights to the people of Iran. The very valued Iranian-American community has been effective <laughs> 
promoting freedom and democracy for their beloved families at home. I would also like to thank my colleague, Mr. Lee Zeldin, for his hard work on H.R. 630, the Counterterrorism Counter Screening Assistance Act of 2019. This critical piece of legislation prioritizes capacity building in foreign countries to prevent and detect terrorist travel internationally. This serious problem will continue to threaten our homeland and our partners abroad until we can minimize any gaps in the international terrorism screening system. I am grateful to Mr. Zeldin, for, as well as lead Republican McCall, for their long history of work on this crucial issue. Lastly, I'd like to express my strong support for Mr. Ted Luce, H.R. 3571, the City and State Diplomacy Act. As a South Carolinian, I know all too well how important the bridges we build with foreign partners on a state and city level can be. The social and economic benefits that come from subnational diplomacy are extremely important, and I thank Mr. Liu for this legislation, which will strengthen these kinds of more local efforts. The Columbia World Affairs Council has been so meaningfully established sister city relationships with Bul Plovdiv, Bulgaria, Kaiserslautern, Germany, Chayabinsk, Russia, and Cluj Napoca, Romania. Chair Emeritus Fred Monk has been very effective. South Carolina, with the leadership of Governor Henry McMaster, promotes the sister state relationship with Rhineland Palatinate, Germany. The sister, the City and State Diplomacy Act will establish an office of subnational diplomacy at the State Department to make sure that cities and states can leverage the power and network of the federal government to promote their own partnerships abroad. This will bring more tourism, more trade, and more foreign direct investments to cities and states across the country. I urge my colleagues on the committee to support this far-reaching bill. Thank you again, Chairman Engel and Leader Republican, and with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Deutsch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this markup today. I'd like to congratulate you and the ranking member uh, for the terrific work this committee has accomplished this year. Uh, I am proud to support all of the good bills that will be we will be advancing today. The House Foreign Affairs Committee recognizes the importance of bipartisan American leadership in advancing American values. That's the leadership that we are providing today, and I commend my colleagues on both sides of the aisle uh, for doing so. In mid-November, popular protests against the Iranian regime began and rapidly spread to at least 100 cities throughout the country in the most significant anti-government demonstrations in Iran since 2009. And while protesters took to the streets in response to an announced increase in the price of fuel, they also called for structural reform of the Iranian political system and condemned current and former leaders. In response, Iranian authorities shut down the internet, security forces used lethal force, killing hundreds of people, making the highest marking the highest casualty rate of any protest movement in Iran since the Islamic Revolution four decades ago, and arresting at least 7,000 more. Congress has long expressed bipartisan support for the human rights of the Iranian people, including the rights to peaceably assemble and protest. Congress has also supported the rights of Iranian dissidents and authorized the licensing of communication services to improve the ability of the Iranian people to speak freely. In keeping with that tradition, uh, HRS 752 expresses the support of the House of Representatives for the rights of the Iranian people to free expression and condemns the regime for its crackdown on the recent legitimate, peaceful protests in Iran. The resolution condemns the Iranian regime's serious human rights abuses, significant corruption, and destabilizing activities abroad, and urges the President and the Secretary of State to work with the international community to ensure that violations of human rights are part of all formal and informal multilateral or bilateral discussions with and regarding Iran. I thank my friend Mr. Wilson for his leadership on this and so many other issues I'm proud to partner with him on. Thank all of my colleagues for their support of this resolution, which demonstrates that Congress stands with the Iranian people against a brutal regime and supports their right to live in a free society. And I yield back the balance of my time. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Deutsch. Mr. Rooney. Thank you, Chairman Engel, Ranking Member McCall. 
I want to thank Chairman Sires, uh, Chairman of the Western Hemisphere Committee, and voice my support for his very important resolution for which I'm thankful to be an original co-sponsor, HRES 754, which expresses the House's support for the brave people of Nicaragua in their struggle for freedom and democracy against the oppressive regime of Daniel Ortega. The resolution highlights the regime's human rights abuses that have led to the deaths of 325 innocent Nicaraguans and injured thousands more in 2018. Today, the regime continues its assault on the Nicaraguan people with no signs of letting up. Just last month, the regime's police forces attacked churches and church leaders throughout the country and cut water to peaceful hunger strikers inside a church in the city of Masaya. These attacks harken back to Ortega's first round as Nicaragua's Marxist communist leader in the early 1980s. Ortega is clearly no less an authoritarian and anti-democratic leader now than he was back then. Ortega mirrors his close allies in Cuba and Venezuela by oppressing dissent. We have seen the reports of arbitrary detentions attacks, and attacks on civil society and independent media that have forced many journalists and government dissenters to flee the country. The Ortegas are responsible for systematic corruption, getting rich by stealing from the people of the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. The Trump administration has rightly responded by imposing sanctions on the Ortega family and other members of the regime who are responsible for corruption and human rights abuses. This resolution recognizes and supports the administration's efforts and calls for additional sanctions and restrictions on the regime's access to foreign financing. Today, I support this resolution in calling on Daniel Ortega to cease all attacks on the Nicaraguan people release all political prisoners, and set the conditions for free and fair elections. The people of Nicaragua have suffered enough, and the House is rightly speaking out against the Ortega regime's crimes. I thank Western Hemisphere Subcommittee Chairman Sires again for introducing this resolution, and will continue to work with him and our colleagues on the committee to support democracy for the Nicaraguan people. I yield back. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rooney. Before I, I call on our on, on next uh, people, I want to just remind <coughs> excuse me, everyone on the committee that we have our um, annual holiday party this evening, starting at 5 o'clock, right in this room with nice ambiance. So we'd like members on both sides of the aisle. <coughs> Mr. McCall and I invite you. Please, please show up for a few minutes and right. welcome, uh, welcome the holiday you. season. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Keating. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, I'm also pleased to join uh, with all of us here uh, supporting uh, the, uh, all the legislation that's being considered uh, on block today uh, in a bipartisan fashion. I'm also uh, honored to join Representative Fitzpatrick in sponsoring the uh, Countering Russian and Other Overseas Kleptocracy Act, or the Crook Act. Russia's political system is built on a network of cronyism and kleptocracy, and exposing and countering Russian corruption and malign influence is a priority for our European Eurasia Energy Environmental Subcommittee. For too long, uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin and uh, other Russian politicians and oligarchs have acted with impunity, exerting undue influence over Russian political and economic policies at home and abroad, and manipulating U.S. and European financial systems to move and disguise their dark money. Their illicit funds are being used to control key economic se sectors, uh, fund political parties, and organizations that advance Russian interests and manipulate political processes and policies. Of course, corruption isn't limited to Russia. Corruption can be found everywhere, inhabiting the dark corners of every county, every country around the globe. So we must shine a light on kleptocrats, ill-gotten gains, and on those who benefit from them. The Crook Act will help prevent Russian and other forms of kleptocracy from eroding democracy, security, and rule of law. It reaffirms U.S. policy to support key partners in promoting good governance and combating corruption. The Crook Act would establish an anti-corruption action fund to assist governments and non-governmental organizations in their efforts to prevent, investigate, combat, uh, and deal with corruption and bribery around the world. The Act would impose a $5 million prevention payment on some of the most corrupt offenders of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act against the most uh, and against the leaders in spreading this malign practice throughout the world. They'll be subject to fines and penalties that exceed 
uh, $50 million and would thus ensure those responsible for corrupt acts that, they're contrib that contribute to uh, efforts to, around the world uh, and inhibit the pro uh, rule of law, uh, that they will seek uh, leadership uh, in countering this from the United States. The Crooked Act also established an interagency task force to work in coordination with U.S. embassies to coordinate assistance efforts, promote good governments in foreign states, and enhance the ability of foreign states to combat public corruption and evaluate foreign states' efforts. I hope all of you will join me uh, in supporting the Crooked Act and ensuring that corruption has no place here in Russia or anywhere else. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Keating. Mr. Fitzpatrick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to speak briefly about two pieces of legislation that are being marked up today that I know both measures will help further our nation's strategic goals. I was proud to partner with my colleague on this committee, Representative Castro, to sponsor the Global Child Thrive Act. This legislation will bolster global early childhood development. Dedicating renewed attention to improving lives, the act emphasizes the effective approaches to assist other countries in implementing child-focused initiatives and reauthorizes sections of the Foreign Assistance Act that would provide help to orphans and other vulnerable children through the year 2025. I would also encourage my colleagues in the Senate to take up the companion bill uh, that is being led by Senator Blunt and Senator Coons, uh, as we have in the House today. Uh, the second piece of legislation I'd like to highlight, um, which was just spoken uh, to from my colleague, Mr. Keating, is the countering Russian and otherwise overseas kleptocracy act, or Crook Act. The Crook Act will establish an anti-corruption action fund to provide extra funding for anti-corruption reform in partner countries, as well as streamline the U.S. government's work building the rule of law abroad. I was fortunate to be able to work with Mr. Keating on this bill and combine my role as a member of this committee and also as a commissioner on the Helsinki Commission. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, this legislation is critically important uh, as an FBI agent who led the FBI's mission to end international corruption. This bill is key to making sure that the right resources are available to the men and women on the front lines of this fight. I would ask all my colleagues to join me in supporting both of these important, important measures. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Fitzpatrick. Mrs. Cicilline. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you and the ranking member for once again holding a markup of bipartisan measures, all of which make progress on important foreign policy initiatives that will further American national security and global leadership. And I particularly want to thank you uh, and to acknowledge the strong bipartisan leadership of the chairman of the ranking member for what has been a very productive year of work on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. I plan to support each of these measures and thank the sponsors for their hard work. I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about some of the bills being considered today. I strongly support H.R. 4864, the Global Child Thrive Act, sponsored by my friends Joaquin Castro and Brian Fitzpatrick. This bill will make important investments in education and early childhood development, recognizing the importance of safety, access to clean water and food, and access to education for the development of healthy young people who can contribute to their own societies. With so many countries around the world experiencing decreasing child mortality rates, it is vital that the United States continue to support important programs to help children not just survive, but thrive. I'm pleased to support H.R. 4508, the Malalia Yousafzai Scholarship Act, sponsored by my colleague and good friend, uh, Hakeem Jeffries from New York. This legislation, of which I'm a proud co-sponsor, requires USAID to provide at least 50% of its merit and needs-based scholarships to women in Pakistan. Women in Pakistan still face enormous discrimination and hardship in assessing education. I'm pleased to see this effort to ensure that our assistance will help give Pakistani women the educational opportunities they need to build leaders of the next generation who will follow in Malala's footsteps. I also want to thank Mr. Deutsch and Mr. Wilson for their leadership in sponsoring HRS 752, a resolution supporting the rights of the people of Iran to free expression and condemning the Iranian regime for its crackdown on legitimate protests. I continuously am in awe of the courage of the Iranian people who are willing to risk their own personal safety to protect the corrupt and violent regime. The Iranian people want the same things everyone wants for themselves and their families food to eat, a safe place to live, and access to real opportunities. The Iranian regime has used repression and fear to maintain control for decades. And when coupled with bad economic policies, the Iranian people have no choice but to say enough. I stand with these brave Iranians and I support their efforts to live freely and strongly support this resolution and urge my colleagues to do the same. And finally, I want to make reference to the Crook Act, 
uh, sponsored by my esteemed classmate, Mr. Keating and Mr. Fitzpatrick. Very proud to support this legislation to really reaffirm America's global leadership in combating corruption as a key and effective tool to promoting democracy, transparency, and honest government around the world. This legislation will strengthen U.S. efforts to advance the rule of law by establishing an anti-corruption action fund at the State Department. And now more than ever, America's leadership on this issue is necessary. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to ask, uh, urge my colleagues to support all of these bills and again thank my colleagues for their strong leadership in presenting them. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Cicilline. Ms. Titus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this markup and for including my bill, H.R. 3373, the Office of International Disability Rights Act, in the en bloc package. There are more than one billion persons with disabilities around the world. Eighty percent live in developing countries. Around 60 percent are women, and there are more than 90 million children with disabilities. Women with disabilities are more likely to experience sexual violence, and children with disabilities are more likely to be malnourished and subjected to violence, isolation, and abuse. They're also less likely to be in school than children without disabilities. Persons with disabilities are often excluded from the labor market, political participation, and meaningful involvement in public life. They are more likely to experience poverty, discrimination, and lack of access to vital resources. The world faces economic losses and cost when societies marginalize people with disabilities. The United States has historically been a leader on disability rights, and it's critical that we remain at the forefront and continue to give this issue the importance it deserves in U.S. foreign policy. The Special Advisor for International Disability Rights was a position created in 2010, and Judy Human, who served in that position, is with us here today. Thank you very much. Uh, she was instrumental in the drafting of this proposed legislation, and I thank her and her team for working with Erica on my staff to bring this forward. As special advisor, Ms. Human and her team helped boost the profile of disability rights within the State Department, raise the visibility of persons with disabilities in the department's policies and programs, and improve the inclusion of disabilities in the annual human rights and trafficking in persons reports. They helped encourage foreign governments to combat discrimination, made democracy and human rights activities more inclusive, and worked to ensure emergency planning and humanitarian aid were accessible to persons with disabilities. Indeed, their work made a real difference around the world. Just one small example, in a meeting with young Mongolian leaders visiting Congress through a USAID program earlier this year, they mentioned to me the support that the U.S. team had provided in helping them to craft their new law on the rights of persons with disabilities in 2016. Unfortunately, the position of special advisor has been vacant since January 2017, and with the vacancy, there's been a corresponding decline in U.S. leadership in the international disability rights arena. H.R. 3373 would restore U.S. leadership by codifying the Special Advisor position and the Office of International Disability Rights at the State Department. It would ensure that State Department personnel receive training so that our programming policies and budgets are disability inclusive, and so personnel working in their respective missions will be able to perform their work through the lens of disability inclusion. The bill also directs state to develop a formal policy on disability inclusion, something USAID has done as in, and is in the progress of updating, but state has not. This will ensure that Congress, disability people's organizations, and the public can better understand the State Department's efforts in these areas and hold them accountable for implementing such work. Disability rights cut across all sectors of foreign assistance, democracy promotion, voting and elections, human rights, labor, global health, education, economic growth and trade, gender equality, agriculture and food security, conflict transformation, and humanitarian recovery and relief. 
We cannot have more than one billion people invisible in the global development agenda or in our foreign policy because of disabilities. It's in the diplomatic, economic, and humanitarian interest of the U.S. to continue to lead internationally on disability rights, and this bill would ensure that we continue to do so. Disability rights are human rights, and I look forward to the bill's full consideration by the House, and I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Titus. Mr. Liu. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Across the country, our cities and states are laboratories of democracy. They are places where innovative policies are developed on everything from resource management to trade to public safety. But our cities and states are also instruments of U.S. diplomacy. For years, mayors, council members, school board members, and governors have been engaging with their foreign counterparts around the globe to share best practices and strike agreements on a range of issues. The growth of sub-national cooperation has enabled cities and states to play an increasing significant role in foreign policy and complement the efforts of the State Department. These engagements support U.S. trade and investment, facilitate cooperation on energy and environment, increase the health and safety of our citizens, and promote people-to-people -people exchanges. Today, global networks make up exclusively of local government officials are at the forefront of harnessing the power of cities to advance international cooperation, including organizations such as the Global Parliament of Mayors, Urban 20, and more. It is in the interest of the United States to promote these sub-national engagements, align them with national objectives, and leverage federal resources to enhance their impact. For too long, however, our cities and states have been conducting this sub-national diplomacy with little to no support from the federal government. That is a missed opportunity by both sides. My legislation being considered today, the City and State Diplomacy Act, seeks to address this major gap. This legislation will do two things. First, it will establish a new office of subnational diplomacy at the State Department that will coordinate all federal resources needed to support our mayors and governors on the world stage. This office will be headed by a senior official of an appropriate rank to represent the U.S. at International Forum and develop their agreements necessary to facilitate more subnational engagement. Second, the legislation authorizes State Department detailees to city halls and state capitals across the country to advise and assist our mayors, council members, school board members, and governors and help them achieve their specific international objectives. I am pleased this legislation has broad support not only from my colleagues across the aisle, but from across the country as well. This legislation will benefit every American city and every state with international interests. I'm also pleased that this legislation has garnered the support of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, the American Foreign Service Association, Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti, and a number of former senior State Department officials from both Republican and Democratic administrations. And also very pleased this legislation has bipartisan co-authors. I'd like to extend my deep thanks to Congressman Joe Wilson of South Carolina for partnering with me on this legislation and for his kind remarks about the bill today. I also want to thank Chairman Ango and Ranking Member McCall for bringing this legislation forward to markup. And I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Liu. Ms. Wild. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the word, last word. I am proud to speak in support of H.R. 4864, the Global Child Thrive Act of 2019. I want to thank my colleague, uh, Representatives Joaquin Castro and Brian Fitzpatrick, for leading on this important legislation. Around the world and here at home, millions of children lack access to vital early childhood development programs. We know from a rich body of research that the first years of a child's life are unparalleled in their potential to shape outcomes later in life. As a result, discrepancies in accessing early learning are a leading cause of inequity in health and well-being, as well as academic and professional success throughout their lives. The Global Thrive Act will position our country to advance early childhood development globally as a major priority of United States government international programming. At a time when 35 million children around the world are refugees or displaced, and when one in every five children internationally lives in a conflict-affected area, this work could not be more urgently needed particularly given the profoundly, impact, the profoundly negative impact of stressful, unstable environments on children's development, we must ensure that coming generations can access these vital services, regardless of the tragic circumstances that they had the misfortune to be born into. 
we must remember our common humanity. I commend my colleagues from both parties for working together to make clear that belief in the importance of early childhood development is a core interest and value of the United States. I urge all of my colleagues on the committee to join me in voting for the passage of H.R. 4864, the Global Child Thrive Act. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Weil. Mr. Allred. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I also want to thank the ranking member for your uh, work in bringing together these uh, bills for us to consider today. Uh, I am happy to support all of them. I would want to specifically mention uh, three bills that I'm a co-sponsor of, uh, the Global Child Thrive Act, the Malala Yousafzai Scholarship Act, and the resolution supporting the rights of the Iranian people to free expression. Uh, the Global Child Thrive Act, introduced by my fellow Texan, Congressman Castro, uh, takes an important step forward in coordinating U.S. interagency efforts towards taking a more holistic approach to supporting early childhood health and development. Through focusing on early childhood development across all sectors from water and sanitation to basic education, uh, the U.S. with our international partners can lead the way in improving the lives of children across the world. The Malala Yousafzai Scholarship Act, named after the world-famous Pakistani activist for education and the youngest Nobel uh, laureate, would require that half of all USAID merit and needs-based scholarships in Pakistan go to women. Uh, this fix takes a huge leap forward in ensuring that women have the same opportunities as men to go to school and reach their full potential around the world. Uh, finally, HRES 752, introduced by my esteemed colleague and friend uh, Ted Deutsch, supports the rights of the Iranian people to free expression and condemns the violent crackdown by the Iranian regime. We in Congress support the rights of the Iranian people to freely assemble without fear of violence from their government. This resolution makes it clear that Congress is watching these events closely and will continue to speak out against violence against peaceful protesters. I yield back. Thank you. Uh are there any other members seeking recognition? Mr. Zeldin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the committee's consideration of these measures in the en bloc package today. First, I would like to express my support for H.R. 630, the Counterterrorism Screening and Assistance Act. This legislation is very similar to legislation that passed twice through this committee in the 114th and 115th Congress with bipartisan support. Since 2011, the situation in Iraq and Syria has presented extra significant challenges for the global community's ability to track and combat foreign terrorist actors. In Europe, roughly 5,000 EU citizens have traveled to Syria or Iraq to become foreign fighters for the Islamic State or other foreign terrorist groups. Our foreign partners have employed various measures to combat foreign fighters to include increasing surveillance and prohibiting travel that have successfully thwarted a number of plots but we need to do more. There's a very serious and well-recognized need for improved international border security and information sharing between governments. This bipartisan legislation would ensure U.S. resources are utilized in the most efficient way possible to help international partners close loopholes in international airport security, better track these terrorists, and prevent them from traveling internationally with a special focus on high-risk and medium-risk countries. H.R. 630 would do this by requiring the Department of State and Department of Homeland Security to accelerate the delivery of certain surplus border security systems to countries of greatest concern and risk for foreign fighter or terrorist travel. The U.S. will attempt to collect reimbursement for transferred equipment, and all equipment transfers will comply with existing regulations related to the export of sensitive technologies. This legislation would also recognize a reporting system to hold our partners accountable by monitoring efforts of foreign governments to combat terrorism and foreign fighter travel. It is essential that the United States work with the global community to monitor and stop the movement of terrorists abroad. I look forward to working with my colleagues in the House and our friends in the Senate to pass and send this bill to the President. In addition to other great bills in this en bloc, I would also like to express my support for H.R. 2343, the Peace and Tolerance in Palestinian Education Act. This was a bipartisan effort working with Mr. Sherman to maintain oversight over UNRWA's educational activities in the West Bank and Gaza. Last year, Congressman Perry and I secured declassification of a shocking GAO UNRWA textbook report revealing what we had suspected all along. The UNRWA textbook initiative was a sham. 
Textbook content in UNRWA schools did not mention Israel or Judaism and included regional maps that excluded Israel and content was included that incited hate and violence. The GAO report found that supplementary material purchased using U.S. tax dollars to counter the anti-Semitic and anti-Israel bias injected by the PA was being rejected and not utilized on the ground. What's worse? The GAO report concluded that Congress has been unable to fully assess the nature and extent of the material in PA textbooks because of the State Department's misleading reports to Congress. It is unacceptable the textbooks that are used delegitimize Israel and demonize Jewish people. We must demand transparency over the anti-Israel textbooks in this program that are fueling another generation of hate. Our bill requires the Secretary of State to submit annual reports to Congress to determine whether schools operated by UNRWA and the Palestinian Authority have removed this offensive textbook content and determine whether any U.S. foreign assistance is being used to support this hateful curriculum. The United States cannot support a program that goes against the best interests of our greatest ally. I would like to thank Chairman Engel and lead Republican McCall for their leadership and assistance on these important issues. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Zeldin. Are there any other members seeking recognition? Hearing no further requests, then without objection, the committee will proceed to consider the noticed items on block. Without objection, each measure is considered as read, and the amendments to each are considered as read and are agreed to. The question occurs on the measures on block as amended, as amended, if amended. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The measures considered on block are agreed to, and without objection, each measure is ordered favorably reported as amended if amended, and each amendment to each bill shall be reported as a single amendment in the nature of a substitute. Without objection, staff is authorized to make any technical and conforming changes. The committee is now adjourned. Thank you very much for your hard work. Good job. Good. Congrats. I need to, yeah. you, you want to ask her?